Uh, my name is Chuck Fieldstein. I work for Bunzel Processor Division. I've uh, been with the company for 22 years. Uh, primary functions for the company has been with the stunner equipment, captive bolt stunner equipment, the electric stunners, uh, along with some other duties. But uh, our company has made a pretty major commitment uh, to human, human handling and stunning for the industry. Uh, there are now two, two specialists, myself included, and Ryan Malone, uh, who just recently graduated from Kansas State University. Uh, we're going to team up uh, from a service standpoint and support standpoint uh, throughout the United States for captive bolt equipment. So if at any time you ever have questions on this type of equipment, operationally, maintenance-wise, troubleshooting, things like that, not only do you have uh, Bunzel Processor Division, you've got myself and, and uh, Ryan Malone, but we also have technicians and experts from manufacturer, from Jarvis, that are available. Uh, they actually have 20 plus service technicians throughout the United States that if need be, um, there could be a service call made to your plant to, to help you through a situation if there happens to be one or to demonstrate equipment, whatever it might be. Um, that being said, what I'm going to say is there's several different types of stunners on the market. Uh, first and foremost, whatever type of device that you're using today, uh, whether it be a pistol, an inline tool, whatever it is, make sure that everybody that's using the equipment knows how to use it safely. Uh, some equipment has manual safeties on it, some are operationally before you make it ready to fire, it's automatically safe, but others don't have any type of safety. So make sure anybody that's using this equipment, you have the manual from the manufacturer, share it with them. If there's videos, whatever it might be, Make sure that you're sharing that with anyone that operates this type of equipment. They need to fully understand from a safety standpoint how they operate. Um, so just kind of get started with this a little bit. We're going to start out with, with one of the more popular models for small animals. Basically, if you look at it from the standpoint, I recommend pistols that this type of a tool weighs down. That type of an animal. So think of swine, lamb. Uh, goats, those types of things. We do have plants use these for beef. Uh, market size beef would be about the maximum size that I'd be using a pistol. Uh, you should really have some type of a head restraint if you're going to use uh, a pistol style. Because imagine trying to shoot like this, you're going to feel it here. You don't have to shoot straight on with a pistol, if, if at all possible. Uh, these tools have a built-in safety. It's called a rolling block safety. So I pull back on the hammer right here. Then I pull back on the firing block. There's the chamber. So the, the power load will go into the chamber there. If I happen to accidentally pull the trigger with the firing block open, and a cartridge there, it cannot fire. That's called, that's the rolling block safety is activated. Once I'm ready to use the tool, so I'm within two or three feet of the animal I intend to use this tool on, forward on the firing block. Now it's in full fire mode. So if I were to pull the trigger here, the hammer would strike the firing pin and cause it to fire. If the animal becomes agitated and stressed, you need to put it back in safety. It's just as simple as pulling back on the firing block again. Notice I keep my finger away from the trigger. Even when I've got it pushed forward, I only go to the trigger when I'm ready to use the tool. So then I just put it back in safe mode again. These tools are available in a 25 caliber and a 22. I would tell you that 95% of these tools that we sell are 25 caliber tools. Not that there's any difference in power to it, it's just the most popular model that we have in the United States. Uh, and, and that's where we, we push these particular tools. These tools, Inherently, just because of the design, very safe. You understand where the business end of the tool is. So from a safety standpoint, we never ever place our hand on the business end, the penetrating rod end of the tool. There is a, an exhaust, mm -hmm. but you can see that. There's an exhaust port here for the hot gases from the cartridge being fired. We want to make sure if we're using this tool, it's not designed as two hand. If you do use two hands to steady the tool, you're going to burn your fingers your hand, your palm, whatever it might be. It's not going to put you in the hospital, but you're going to definitely feel it and you won't do that again. Put it that way. 
anytime you're using a cap and bolt tool like this, especially these tools, uh, we want to make sure at the end of every day that you're cleaning it. Uh, it's one of the biggest setbacks for plants uh, where they get them they use the tool continuously, but they never go through and they maintain and, and don't maintain it and don't clean it. These tools are designed, there's wear parts. Uh, the more you use them, the faster they're going to wear. With pistols, uh, the type of cartridge you use in terms of strength is going to accelerate. If you use a stronger cartridge, it's going to accelerate the wear of some of these parts. I'll show you that. So bear with me while I take the muzzle off here. And uh, Chuck, I just want to thank you for making the trip out to the Pacific Northwest uh, while you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, it's been an enjoyable trip, long flight, yeah. but it's an enjoyable trip out here. I enjoy doing this. This is, a, this is part of the job that I really like, uh -huh. it is to teach. Awesome. And love to teach these things. So. And if, if you guys have any questions, uh, ask, and I'll uh, let Chuck know. And, yeah, we'll continue going on. Uh, this I learned earlier today, and this just blew my mind as someone who's used one of these machines for many years. So, yeah, I, I love this, what's about to happen. So, so this tool, this is what's called a self-retracting system. What that means is when you fire this particular tool and use it for the intended purpose, this tool will actually reset the, the penetrating rod back into position for the next shot, provided you've maintained these components. And the way it works, so what you've got here at the very top, this, this washer here is called a stop washer. It's designed to do just what it says. It's designed to stop these sleeves from being pushed out the end of the muzzle so they don't get pushed out here. The wear on that is always on the inside diameter. So as an example, this is a brand new one. If there was wear on this side, you could flip this over and put it back on the other way and get longer life. That'll, that'll extend the life of that particular washer. Next are what we call stunning rod buffers. And on this is, happens to be the standard length. There's eight of these stunning rod buffers, okay? Very important that these are maintained. These are what retracts the bolt back out of the animal's head and resets it for the next shot. Never recommend when you're cleaning or doing maintenance, we don't want to use oils or solvents or anything to clean these. These should be taken out dry. Use a, a washcloth of some type, clean them up. These are nice and new. Uh, they're going to turn black. They're going to get dark, uh, but don't use solvents on these. Just wipe them and check them for any wear. And then at the very base here, there you can see this blue washer, that's called a flange washer. And that's designed, I'll show it to you here in a minute, but that's designed to flatten out that first one on. So what happens when you fire the tool, a pistol like this, the energy of the cartridge is extended right here. It, when it's fired, this little dished out area right there, that expansion chamber is where the cartridge fires into directly. That drives the bolt down into the animal's head. If you're using for small animals, say uh, baby pigs, as mm -hmm. an example, we might use a pink cartridge. That's a, a 1.25 grain cartridge. This might compress to about right here. So these sleeves will compress down. Once they get down to that full compression, then they have to reset themselves. Yeah. So when they reset, that's what draws it back out. The strongest cartridge, a black or an orange cartridge, the maximum you're going to get is about right here to this sleeve. Uh, and what happens is, is if you're using a blue cartridge, like an example, I'll just start with that, a 3.0 grain cartridge, you're going to get about the same compression. It's the orange and black is just going to get you to this point faster. It's not going to go any deeper into the animal's head. It's just going to be the speed that the bolt travels. So these will compress to about here. So you're going to get about two and three quarters to three inches of penetration depth on average with a pistol. Once they go full uh, hydraulic, meaning that they are fully engulfed inside the barrel, they have to reshape themselves and then reset back into the gun. If these are weak or worn, the bolt can have a tendency to stick. That's an indication you need to service the tool. Okay. So it is recommended when you're doing maintenance and service on these, the first one on and the last one on take the most abuse. 
So when you take these off of the penetrating rod, try and keep them in the same order when you take them off and then take these two and put them into the middle okay. for the next time. Okay. So you're getting longer life out of them that way. Okay, so they share the brunt of the, um, they all equally share the force. That's, That's correct. correct. Okay, yeah. awesome. You get more even wear out of it. Um, do anyone, does anyone have any questions? All right. Here. The next thing that we want to talk about is the stunning rod itself. So it's really important. This is obviously the most important part of the tool other than the cartridge, the chamber firing it. Uh, stunning rods have to be taken care of. Uh, these, this is a brand new one, obviously. You can see it's nice and clean and shiny. As you use these, they'll start to stain. Mm -hmm. It's really important to clean the, what I call the piston end of the tool. Use uh, the easiest thing and cheapest way to do this, green scratch pad. Okay. Just use a, a, a 3M or whatever yeah. kitchen scratch pad. Clean it all up. We want to make sure we get any uh, burnt on gunpowder or things like that. This should be nice and smooth all around through the piston area. Okay. And then do the same thing down the shaft of the bolt. You want to make sure that we get it clean so we can inspect it. Mm -hmm. We're looking for any kind of hairline cracks or anything like that. Yeah. And then we're going to make sure we clean out this end of the penetrating rod. It's hollowed out to about five-eighths of an inch. I don't know if you can see that on the video. But this is actually hollow to about here on the penetrating rod. So you want to make sure you get a pick. If there's a, a bone chip or debris, other debris built yeah. up in here, we want to get that out. Mm -hmm. This is purposely done. So this tool on the penetrating rod, if you put your finger on that, Travis... You feel the sharpness on the inside yeah, edge. Yeah, that's crazy. It's sharp on the inside edge, not the outside. A mistake that a lot of plant operators make is they think they're sharpening the penetrating rod by taking emery cloth, sandpaper, a grinder, a file, mm. and filing the outside edge. Yeah. You, you don't want to do that. You want to make sure you're sharpening it on the inside edge. There are sharpening tools that can do that on like a Dremel mm. or, a, or a drill. So, Myra, hi. It's Travis. I'm also here. That <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, so with that being said, it, it's real. That's why it's so important. So these are designed to cut through the head, mm -hmm. and what happens is when they cut through the bone chip that actually the penetrating rod chip uh, cuts through, when the bolt gets to its full extension at that speed, that bone chip now becomes a projectile, mm -hmm. and it goes through the brain. And sometimes it's embedded as as deep as the brain stump. Okay, so wow. it causes a deeper stump. Yeah. That's why it's important. It's like a stamp that stamps out that. All the way through. Okay. Yeah. So. That, yeah. And then, uh, and then what model is this one that we're, we're going over just to reiterate? So this is the Jarvis pistol, uh, past stunner, uh, model. This is model number. Let me look here real quick. This is the model 4144-132. So this is the long bolt. I just had to recount. This oh. is not the standard bolt. So there's nine sleeves here. Yeah. On the long bolt, the standard bolt has eight. Okay. Okay. Cool. So cleaning wise, real quick, I like to cover cleaning and maintenance. Very important that this is inspected after every day's use. Mm -hmm. Don't let it go a week. Don't let it go two weeks. If you shot this tool during the day in your harvest, in your plant, it should be inspected at the next, next operation or before the next operation. Most important is so that you're treating the animal right. Yeah. You want to make sure your equipment's working correctly. Yeah, that certainly is something that will help um, with humane handling and a great preventative measure Absolutely. To, to ensure, uh, you know, animal welfare, right, essentially. So yes. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So the other part are these two components. You want to make sure that you're cleaning these. All of the Jarvis tools are shipped with the proper cleaning tools. Mm -hmm. Pistols have uh, one unique device. This tool is used to clean what's called the undercut, and it just bottoms out. Mm -hmm. This should be done every week. Okay. It should be cleaned and maintained every yeah. week. It's got two little areas for scraping. Oh, um, no. Okay, cool. Right there, they're built. One side's flat, the other side has these two little kickouts. So that's what goes down to the barrel. Okay. Just like that. So we should clean this out. If you need to use gun cleaning solution, don't use WD-40s and stuff like that. Use something that's made for weapons. Is okay. What's recommended. And just spray a little bit in there. Let it soak up. Take the brush. 
cleaning brushes come with it. If there's loose debris, you can use the, the, the brass brush. Mm -hmm. If it's very heavy debris, you can use the steel brush and do it that way. Awesome. Okay. So we want to do the same thing with the muzzle. Make sure that the muzzle is clean. There's one additional part if I can get it out of there. Oh, wow. There's a barrel lock washer. And it actually, there's a seat right inside. Um, you can see that or not, if there's a good view of it. But basically what it does is this is a cushion that cushions the barrel end right here to the inside of that muzzle. If this part is missing or worn, what will happen is these sleeves here, they will break up and cut off in little rings about this side. Okay. If this is missing. Yeah. Wow. So we want to make sure it's in good, good condition as well. Because that lip will act as a cutting edge when, right. it, when it expands. When it expands into that, it'll cut them off. Okay. Exactly. Science, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So then we just put everything back together. We want to make sure we clean out the, the muzzle end here and get all the debris built out, out of that. And then we can reassemble. Mm -hmm. If there is something to do, we just go back here. And screw it in hand tight with this tool is perfectly fine. Okay. Awesome. We do have full maintenance videos, safety, operations, cleaning, and full maintenance. We're not going to tear the, the tool completely apart, but there are about 10 to 15 components internal. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I look at, there is what's called a, a uh, sear rod, mm -hmm. a sear rod spring here. Uh, release pin, release pin spring. If we have this closed and I reach over the hammer, if I can move the firing block, yeah, my hand, that's an indication that that release pin spring is weak. Okay, and it should be replaced. Okay. And the other thing is, it does have a built-in extractor. So if you watch here, this part, notice how that pulls out when I pull back on the firing block. That's what extracts the spent cartridge, so I can pull it out. That should snap back. Watch as I pull forward or pull back on it. It automatically snaps back in place. If this part does not do that, there's an extractor spring. It's a curly spring. That would need to be replaced on that tool. Okay. We want to make sure that is functioning. Yeah. And that, that's something you'd recommend just a, a plant have on hand, like an extra one or something. Yes. Okay. You should have all the components internal that we just went through here. should have full backup set. Awesome. Should have a release pin spring and an extractor spring. Yeah. At a minimum. Yeah. And I'll just say that if every plant should have a backup system, but don't plan on your backup system to harvest parts off your traditional That's, system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So nowadays, as you probably are aware, most inspectors will require you to have two different study devices. Yeah. So if one should happen to fail, mm -hmm. and God forbid, we hope that it doesn't, but if it, it happens, I'm not going to tell you it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You can't use that particular, that, that same tool. For the second shot. Yeah. And I've had to have a backup tool. Yeah, I've had to write uh, you know, getting a NOE and creating a robust I mean, handling plan to correct something like that. Yes. So let's just keep parts around everybody. That's right. Keep <laughs> parts around and maintain it. Yeah. I mean uh, I I hear from customers that say my solder's not working properly, I'm not getting it to fire or whatever it might be, or I'm not getting the penetration issue. It's not it's not stunning the animal. Mm -hmm. And you start to question them and then you find out well we haven't taken it apart. Mm -hmm. in two or three weeks. I've yeah. gotten stutters like this back where I couldn't get the muzzle off. Because it's just so caked with... Caked with... It's rusted together. It never, and once I do finally get it apart, mm -hmm. then it's just a mess on the inside. Yeah. So it's really important to take care of your tools. Yeah. And, and store in a dry area. We all know uh, uh, harvesting floors are notoriously wet, damp, humid places. So yeah. certainly store correctly. <laughs> Don't use water to clean Okay. Awesome. Don't use water if you can avoid it. If you have, if you feel you have to spray it off or clean it off with water, completely disassemble it and let everything dry. Let okay. it completely dry before you put it back together. Okay. Rust, rust is your enemy. Yeah. So. All right. So we'll move. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, uh, did you see? Or? No, not people just waving a bunch. Excellent. I'm going to go set up my phone so I can get people from mine, okay. but without the audio delay, I just pull my phone and say, it fades the water. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Yeah, absolutely.
So next we're gonna talk about what we call the PAS cylinder or C-type stunners. And I have three, three different models today that we're gonna talk about. Um, the first one is probably the predominant tool in the industry uh, as far as beef plants and swine plants right now. Um, this is the model uh, 4144061. It, this is the standard length uh, cylinder style stunner uh, that we, we have. Uh, this tool is a, what's called a free flight bolt system. Uh, we'll explain that. Uh, from a safety standpoint, this one, it does have a safety. All of our cylinder style stunners do have a manual safety on them. So if you watch at this point right here, and, and granted everybody, I just want to rest assure you, I don't have any cartridges in this. So typically I wouldn't handle it this way, but I, I wanted you to see this. So right now I, it's in safe mode. So if you can see this, when I rotate, you'll see that there's a separation right here. Maybe there's a good shot. So when I put it back in safe mode, notice how it closes that separation, that gap. What I just did is by putting it in safe mode, if this tool were ready to fire, if I were to accidentally pull the trigger, it cannot fire because mm -hmm. the firing pin is locked away from being able to strike the cartridge. Yeah. So these are designed as a two-piece stunner. So you've got the breech barrel assembly and you've got the firing cap assembly. The way I make this ready to fire, we'll run through this first, is cartridge is going to go into this chamber. I'm going to put my, my cartridge here. There is a triple thread. I don't know if you can see it with the lighting, but there's three different positions with which I can start this cap. Okay. It makes it very quick. So now I've got my cartridge here. I'm going to cock this tool that's still in safe mode. And when I go to use this, when I'm within close proximity to the animal, within two or three feet of the animal, or if it's in a knock box, notice I keep my fingers away from the trigger button. Trigger button is here. I keep my fingers away from that. I'll reach up and I'll rotate the fire, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to put it in the animal's head and fire. Yep. If the animal is stressed, rather than just firing the tool, I'm going to rotate this back to safety and take it apart. Mm -hmm ultimate safety that way yeah and then i'll just say if, if if your job is knocking and you feel you're have an animal that you can't comfortably knock um i think it's up to you to make that judgment call to, to maybe put this one back in the pen uh, you know there's so many other things to avoid uh causing more stress or injury to you or the animal uh, good point it, like you said, if the animal is stressed, it's ambulatory, uh, whatever it might be, let the animal settle down. Don't get yourself or the plant in trouble by trying to, to keep harvest moving. Yeah. Do it the right way. Do it the right way for the animal. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. Um, with this particular tool as well, uh, with that being said, we're going to actually, I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk a little bit about handling this particular tool because, as you can see, for some people that have never used a captive bolt tool, an inline tool might be a little bit uh, intimidating to them. Mm -hmm. So, what I do in terms of safety, first and foremost, because I'll be honest with you, and I think most plants will say this, mm -hmm. hardly anybody uses the safety. Yeah. And once they get it to fire mode, have you experienced that? Yeah, I've, I've experienced that as well. Yeah. That, that is just. Uh, it's something that is glossed over. It is. And, you know, you get yourself in a hurry. Mm -hmm. You don't think about it. You've used it for so many years or months or whatever it might be that you just don't think about it. Yeah. So what I like to teach is from a safety standpoint, if I am the operator, I want to make sure I'm keeping my coworkers safe as well with mm -hmm. tools like this. So imagine if I, if I have this tool, I don't know if there's a cartridge in here. Oh. And I want to hand it off to Travis. Yeah. You know, if we think about this, who's in trouble here? You know, if Travis yeah. is right here and I'm trying to hand it to him, who could get injured? Obviously him, Travis. Right. If I hand it off like this and he accidentally grabs it by the trigger, now I'm at harm. Mm -hmm. The best way for cylinder style stunners, break it apart and hand it off in two pieces. Okay. That way nobody can get injured. That's great. Because I've, I've, uh, I've experienced that thing where people are like, quick, hand me that, or quick, you know, and there's just, if this is being stored as a backup, it, 
the person handing it may not know that it's in the go position. Yes. And they get handed, and then all of a sudden, it could just be a weird fumble. A, a tool goes off. Yeah, because a lot of the, um, it's just ac- accidents. They are. Yeah. They are. It, it, and the other thing is with this, your coworkers get them into the habit. They don't accept it from anyone in one piece. You mm-hmm. make them back away and, and make sure that they get it in two pieces that yeah. way. I would, I would like to say just like shooting range etiquette, just do everything you think, like don't cross the path of someone else. Don't do all these things to, and it may, you may think it's silly or overkill, but if, if you have a zero incident record, then is it really silly? Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Exactly. So, so this tool is designed for market-sized beef animals, swine, lamb, goats, pretty much everything with the exception of very large animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may get occasional success with a bull or a boar or a sow uh, type of an animal or a large Holstein animal. Uh, you may also experience bad experiences for that animal with yeah. this type of a tool. There are others made for those larger animals. But this, for, for a uh, small plant, medium-sized plant, uh, market sized beef animals, this is a perfect tool. Um, with this one, oh, ooh, forgot that's going on. Sorry about that. So, we're going to take maintenance wise and cleaning wise and how these operate. Let me break this one apart. And you'll see, based on what you just saw with the pistol, so this is what I call a free flight bolt system. If you remember on the pistol, the penetrating rod was fully covered. Mm hmm. Those are very useful for small animals, very safe to use, and has enough power to stun those smaller animals. Yeah. With that pistol, you're at about three inches of penetration. Here with this one, with the sleeves on here, you're going to be at around three and a half to three and three quarters of inches of penetration. But not only that, now I can bump up my power to a five grain cartridge, so it's a stronger cartridge yeah. with these, and it can withstand that added power. Okay. And someone uh, just asked a great question. And maybe uh, they said, is the bolt supposed to remain out after fire? Yes. On on a free flight system, yes. Okay. Uh, just to show you that as an example. So when, when this tool is fired, and I'll show you here when I get it all back together, but it can range where the bolt will stay out there. It, it could go about anywhere. And in some cases, I've seen it bounce all the way back into that. Mm-hmm. That That is normal. Uh, these are not designed to retract, not a free flight. The advantage to the free flight system is a better stun, a stronger stun. So mm-hmm. there's more power invested in these uh, or available in these, so I shouldn't say invested. Um, the drawback is, as we talked about earlier, with these types of tools, 75 to 80 percent of the time, it's going to retract itself back out of the head. And yeah. But in that other 20 to 25 percent, it could stick in the animal's head. And you got to be on it. You got to be on it. Or my suggestion, if it sticks, let it go. Yeah. You aren't going to really damage the tool. Okay. They're pretty hardy. Okay. And it happens. Yeah. Uh, just from a safety standpoint, just let, let the tool fall with the animal and address it once you get the animal shackled and, and everything else. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, but no, that's normal. And we'll walk you through operationally okay. how to reset that. Good question. Really good question. Yeah. I'm going to go try to do that thing again to get. So from a maintenance standpoint, same types of things here. Uh, you've got two black buffers. These are a harder buffer. They're, they're more solid. And then the red buffer is a little bit softer. It's sandwiched between the two blacks, just like that, on all of the cylinder style tools that are free flight. So you've got it just like that. There is also a barrel lock washer that accomplishes the same thing. It is cushioning this surface of the breech from the inside of the barrel. So it just goes here. A lot of times when I'm out doing service calls or maintenance and training, this particular part is missing. So we want to make sure that those parts are in there. Everything that I have in my hand here These are replaceable parts. Penetrating rod works the same way as on the pistol. We want to make sure that we're cleaning and maintaining the piston end, the shaft of the the penetrating rod, and then also the same thing if it's hollow. 
So we're going to clean that out and also it's sharp on the side edge. So make sure that that is maintained and not ripped it off. If you find that you're not getting a good proper stun on an animal, this would be one of the first things I would check is to make sure that the penetrating rod is not rounded off. It should be a nice sharp edge. If it's rounded or blunted, replace the penetrating rod. Okay. Now, how do these work? These particular tools, um, when we start talking about the power of the tool, there's actually two components that drive the energy of this tool besides the cartridge. So you've got the breech. The breech actually has four grooves built into it. They're machined into it that start about the top of the threads and then they come out. So they are machined in an outward fashion so they get wider at the base. All of the energy of this tool, let me take you back up here, sorry. So right now, if, if this tool were set up and ready to fire, the rod would be about in that position inside the breech. All of the energy of this tool is developed in that short travel period right there. These grooves start right at about the top of the, of the threads. Mm -hmm. So if we maintain the breech and up inside above those grooves, we want to inspect that. If you get a lot of heavy pitting, rusting damage up inside the breech, that can cause a loss of compression. Okay. So again, I mean, if you think about that, you're looking at about an inch and a quarter of travel distance mm -hmm. is where the speed goes from zero mm -hmm. to upwards of 205 feet per second. Put this back together. Maintenance wise, we want to make sure so we're cleaning this, we're maintaining the rod, maintaining all the different parts and so forth, and then also the barrel. We want to inspect the barrel uh, here. Let me put this back together. So I've got the barrel washer is there, the lock washer is there, I've got the buffers on there, and I'm going to put the breech back on. Another important part of this particular tool is there's what's called a breech locking cover right here. It's this rubber cover around the breech. That is actually, it's not designed for comfort, although it will give some comfort for the operator. This is actually designed to lock the firing cap mechanism onto the breech barrel assembly. And you can probably hear that squeak. That's what we're after. We want to make sure that that's good and tight and we assemble it all the way down. If we don't assemble it all the way down, we could have a space or a gap here between there and the inside face of the firing cap. If that happens when you fire the tool, the top part of the cap could flatten out on you. Now, just to address the question that we had earlier uh, about whether the bolt penetrating rod should stick out, so with the free flight systems, there's actually what's called a retention system here at the end of the barrel. There's a pin, there's a collar, there's a, a ball, and there's a spring. It's a rubber spring there. It actually puts side pressure on the penetrating rod. So when this tool, if you just use this tool, it's important. We don't just, that's not resetting the penetrating rod. Yeah. If we were to use this tool with the penetrating rod in that position, we've lost about 50% of the power of the tool. Okay. So the cap is actually designed to fit right into the end of the penetrating rod. We push it and we push it in. Okay, wow. So now it's back up in there about three eighths of an inch. I just want to know how many people have been doing it wrong. I see it a lot. Okay. An indication of that is if you see this cap, there's a knurled part of this cap. Mm -hmm. Some people do this. If they try to hit it back in there, don't do that. Use the cap properly, put it on the end. It's designed to fit perfectly into that mm -hmm. end of the bolt and push it back in there. Okay. The other thing I see is some people just take it, push okay. it down onto a flat spot. That countless people just doing that on a piece of concrete. Yeah. And then you'll have an in ineffective stun. Yeah. And then they wonder why something is thrown up. Yeah. No. Storage wise with these tools, I suggest you store them in two parts. Never ever have the tool laying around with a live cartridge on it inside the chamber. Mm -hmm. Just for the safety of everybody in the plant, store it like this, no cartridge. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. I don't know if there's any more questions or not. 
Yeah. So, so the second one that we have, this is one of our more popular tools right now. Uh, so this is an inline tool, operates basically the same way as the last one that I just went through. So it won't take as long on this one. But this particular tool has a self-retracting bolt. Okay. So the firing cap assembly, the safety, everything is pretty much the same on this particular tool. Hmm. Where we see a difference is just like with the pistol, now we've got the retraction available. So my guess, yeah, no, no, I was going to say my guess is there's more bushings in there. There are a little bit different configuration. Oh, look at that. We put that one together. It smashed. Oof. And that's why we inspect. Yeah. So that one was kind of out of position when this tool was assembled. So if you can see that. So that would be something to always inspect your tools. That's why we do that. And then do that intentionally, by the way. Yeah. Um, so there you can see now we're back to the self-retracting type of tool. Biggest difference between this one and the pistol is now you've just got a little bit different type of a stop washer. There's four of these smaller stop washers in sequence here. So this one, I can use a stronger cartridge. Mm -hmm. I can get up to the five grain, not the three and a half or four grain like with the pistol, but I'm still only going to get about three and a half inches of penetration with this particular tool. Okay. Okay. But this has probably been our most popular tool uh, of the last several weeks now, if not months. Okay. And I'm done. So the same thing is true here. We're going to do the same cleaning and maintenance as we did with the pistol. We're going to go through all of these different sleeves. We're going to clean the breech. We're going to clean the, the barrel end. Uh, notice there's no retention system here. It's not required. That's one of the biggest benefits of this type of a tool from an inline standpoint. Gives us more power, uh, where, but less that we have to think about for resetting the bolt. Okay. Um, so we're going to reassemble this guy. And weight-wise, these all will be in that six to seven pound weight range. Uh, very comfortable to handle. Um, and, I, and I don't know, are we still have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're still yeah. on. So very comfortable to handle. Same thing is true here. I'm going to use two fingers. Some people like to use their palm. Yeah, I see that a lot. What do you think of that? I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah. I have more control from a safety standpoint here than I do here. Yeah. Because you, you, you can just messed up and just fired at that yes. point yep. in, into a place you don't want it to go. And one thing we didn't cover from a safety standpoint, so if I take this tool, let's say I have a light cartridge and I assemble it and I don't have this in safe mode. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but this tool right now, if I were to drop it, mm -hmm. if I were to drop it and it landed on this cap, yeah. it'll fire. Yeah, that's why I was saying that if if it's if it's loaded, even in safety, if someone bumps this, they, that person handling it could get, could get shot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and just to back up, just so you know this as well, don't think that this, if I had a live cartridge in the pistol, so if I open this up, put a live cartridge in it, then I'm thinking I'm going to close this all up mm -hmm. and have it ready to go. Same thing is true. If I drop this tool and it lands on the firing pit or the or the hammer, mm -hmm. if it lands here on the ground, it's going to fire. Yeah, because essentially these are rim fire. It's a rim fire. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> okay. So that one again. So this tool, uh, market size beef and everything below. Okay. Sheep. Hogs, all those types of things. Very, very user-friendly tool. Yeah. The last one that I brought, this is if you do large bulls, if you do boars, if you do sows, things like that. Uh, that's where this particular tool comes into play. This is the super heavy-duty model. Mm -hmm. uh, the 4144059 is the Jarvis number on it. Everything is operationally the same. Okay. The biggest difference is is if you compare the barrels. Full cylindrical, so solid metal versus the cutout metal on the standard. Much heavier. Yeah. 
Uh, and there's a reason for that. So what we're trying to do is drive more energy into the bolt system, the penetrating rod. Yeah. This helps that weight helps to hold it down onto the head more. So there's less, there's less to bounce back, less yeah. bounce back. All the energy awesome. is de delivered forward. This is a long bolt version. So it's about five and a half inches of penetration. Mm -hmm. Free flight has the same retention system, just a little bit of a different setup with it, mm -hmm. but the same retention system. So we still have to reset the bolt after every shot. The bolt will stay out. Okay. So we still have to reset the bolt on this. Yeah. That's but very powerful tool. Bulls, boars, bison, sows. Yeah. And I think that it, just the information, if someone didn't know about using this to reset that and they're watching this for the first time, then this video is already helped out. Helped out so much. Good. Thank you. Know. Well, and the other thing is a lot of plants, the smaller plants that I've gone to, don't even know that this can be taken apart. Mm -hmm. I, we've got the maintenance video. If you wanted to see the maintenance video, just request it. We can get it to you. But this all breaks apart. One part that I find often is customers will call and say, hey, my tool's not firing. I pull the trigger, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If there is no strike on the rim of the cartridge, it's not the cartridge. Yeah. It's going to be something with the firing cap. Either the firing pin spring is weak, which is what I'm compressing or pulling here, or the other thing it can be is this safety. Note, I can't turn that by hand. Yeah. This part right here, the inner safety we call this, that can turn with a wrench. Okay. So if it's loose, if you can just freely turn this by hand after you're using the tool, mm -hmm. that can cause it. Because if I don't get it turned tight all the way back, mm -hmm. then I've got to basically engage the safety. Okay. Same type of a thing. Wow. A quick, easy test for firing pin springs. Now, this is a brand new one. But put, put the tool in fire mode, hold it upside down, and compress the trigger. Okay. So when I compress that, notice this gap, it didn't change. Yeah. If that changes, say, and it drops to there. Mm -hmm. Then you got a bad pin. It's an in indication you got a bad spring. Okay. Wow. Firing pin spring needs to be replaced. Okay. Very simple. I like that. That's something that people yeah. could just do before their first animal. The other thing, I'm going to back up just a little bit. So the other thing that I find with loss of power is because of the retention system, that these four parts are replacement parts. With The more you use it, the more the likelihood you're going to have to replace the spring, especially. Mm -hmm. But there's a really simple test to do before you start using this tool for the day. Don't put a cartridge in. Assemble the tool together and do what I call a snap test. Okay. Just shake it two or three times. Uh -huh. If the penetrating rod, if this rod drops out freely mm -hmm. very easily, you need to change these parts. Okay. Get them changed out of there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like that. That's what? the tools. Okay. Let's uh let's set up and and show the testing system. Sure. All right. So so Jarvis has got a digital testing system that actually will tell us about the uh, operation of the tool. You know, a lot of people will take a stunner, no matter what brand it is, they'll put a cartridge in it, they'll assemble it, they'll trigger it, and they'll just fire it in the air. If you think about it, all that's really telling you is that the cartridge fire is not telling us whether or not that tool is actually in proper working condition. Uh, it can be used on an animal. It's it's important to know the bolt velocity. How fast is that bolt going is a true measurement. And that gives us, it, it'll tell us if we have proper compression within the barrel uh, and breech assembly. And we actually have a performance tester that tells us that. Uh, I'm going to wait until Travis comes back in. But basically this tool is, it's two components. You have the display module for programming and storage of the data. And then here, this is the test base itself. Now, this test base is not mounted properly uh, just because of the video, from a video standpoint and ease for today. But there are three mounting plates that this should be bolted down to a solid surface. It shouldn't be just mounted onto a, a wooden table or anything like that. We want a really good solid surface to, to make sure it's operating correctly. Uh, the way it works, there's actually two laser eyes that are built into this unit. Uh, what it does is the first laser eye, they're about an inch and a half apart from each other. 
Um, once the penetrating rod passes that first eye, it starts the timer. When it passes the second one, it stops it, and the device actually measures that speed between the two is what happens there. So we can use this for any cylinder style, impact stunner, pistol style stunner uh, that's out there uh, from, a, from Jarvis standpoint. We've got all the parameters for that. Um, and I don't know, Travis, you want to maybe zoom in. Yeah. Let's go through this. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to program in the first tool. And this is all touch screen. So we're going to go to add edit. And all I have to do is hit serial number. And I'm just going to use 110002. If I make a mistake, I can backspace. Say I wanted that to be a three, real simple. Mm -hmm. I hit enter. Next is the model of the tool. And let's go ahead and we're going to go ahead and just do this particular model. And most of these are, pro are set up. So it's got the model number right on it. So we're going to go 41440061. And we're going to hit enter on that. Next, if you want to keep track of the maintenance and who's doing the maintenance on the tools, uh, in most larger plants, they do this. If you can put a four-digit code for the operator and who's actually doing the maintenance and stunning testing. So I just use, for me, I just use the last four digits of my phone number, 6121, and I hit enter. Now it's all ready to go there. I save that and hit the home button. Now I can see all of the information that I just entered is actually on the screen and I can verify that before I go and start the test. I do have, if you're okay with it, mm -hmm. yeah. a little loud. Absolutely. And I, I'll be honest with you right up front with this being loose on the table, I don't know what we're going to get. Normally they're mounted down, so we might not get a correct reading here because of that. So now I'm going to put my cartridge into the chamber. Actually, back up. I'm going to go ahead and mount this in just because of that. So if you look down in there, there's a cushion. I don't know if you can see it down inside. So this is going to stand up on that cushion. And this is going to be self-centering. So when I pull this, there's actually four pads, jaw pads. Okay. That when I pull this, notice how nice and perpendicular it is now. It's, mm -hmm. it's straight for me. Now I'm going to put my cartridge in. And I'm going to make sure back to safety. Okay. So I've got it in safe mode. I'm going to cock that and make it ready to fire before I do anything else. And then I'm going to assemble. So I do that so that I don't accidentally fire the tool. Next, I can start. I have to hit start test here. And arm tester. Notice here, I can do the same thing here. I can hit the button on the base. So if you wanted to mount this remotely, you could do that mm -hmm. and arm everything here. I've already got it, just so you know. So I'm set up with the yellow loads. It's a lighter load. It's not the most powerful load for this tool, but we can test it with these, and I prefer to test with a lighter load. On the screen now, I'm ready to fire. You can see I've got the yellow load selected. Notice the number here right below the cartridge. It says 132. Mm -hmm. That's our minimum speed for passing. Okay. So this penetrating rod has to operate at 132 feet per second to pass. Okay. And we'll show you, we're gonna go ahead and fire. So fire in the hole here. Typically, and I, I apologize right up front, I don't have the safety gear. Could potentially should be wearing a vest, mm -hmm. a knocker vest to protect ear glass or uh, earplugs and eyewear. Yeah. So apologize for that up front. This isn't proper, but we're trained enough. We're going to go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. So we're going to rotate for fire. And I am going to hold down somewhat to try and get the best result we can. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready to go. And now you can see on the reading, that was with just a yellow load. So the minimum speed to pass was 132. Mm -hmm. This is the actual speed of that bolt was 168.01 feet per second. Wow. So we passed. That's green. Mm -hmm. The background is green. That's a visual indication that it passed. And if it's programmed that if it didn't pass, it would be red. Let's, let's do another one. All right. And, and here's a perfect training example for you. Mm -hmm. With a cylinder style tool that is free flight. Let's get you out there. 
So let's just imagine somebody did that. Okay. Instead of doing it properly, let's retest. And we're going to go with yellow again. And you'll see a difference in bolt speeds here. Again, I went back to safe mode. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go here. Arm tester goes back to zero. So we're ready to fire. Okay. So I'm going to go back here and fire in the hole. Even audibly, you get, whoa. Look at the difference. 30%, 35% of the speed of the bolt just went away. Yeah. Because we did not properly reset the, the penetrating rod mm -hmm. on the tool. So that's why it's really important that we maintain, clean, maintain, replace worn parts, double check everything before you use the tool on an animal. Let's talk about the cartridges a little bit. So this is a rim fire cartridge. Mm -hmm. You can see the indentation here. If you were to use a tool, any stunner, uh, especially a rim fire type stunner, if there is no mark whatsoever on the cartridge, mm -hmm. it, it is not a cartridge issue. I get that call a lot. Mm -hmm. the cartridge didn't go off. I got dead cartridges. Yeah. And you know, we talked to them about it. There's not a strike point. Yeah. So it's not a cartridge. It's going to be something within the, the tool itself. Okay. Whether it's a pistol or an inline tool, whatever it may be. Awesome. Okay. And then I, I would say what, what you want to... Um, to end on. Uh, uh. Well, let's finish up. Okay. Here. Okay. I, yeah. guess I, didn't, I don't have them. I was going to show you there are two different types of, of, uh, of uh, cartridges. This is pretty typical for pistols. This particular, you see the step down. Okay. Pistols will always have a step down. Okay. The inline tools typically are going to be just a full jacket. Okay. No step down. And don't enter use them. Uh, you can use these in an inline tool, mm -hmm. but you couldn't use a straight one in a pistol because it won't go. Okay. It won't fit. Physically okay. fit. In okay. A pistol. Okay. All right. All right. Do you I want, hope that was helpful. Yeah. Well, we're still alive. If you just want to tell people where where they could find all this stuff. Yeah. So we have a website, uh, Muzzle Processor Division. Uh, you can call me directly at 319-573-6121. Uh, I'd be more than happy to help you answer any questions, whatever it might be, or put you in contact with someone that can get a demo to you. Uh, myself and Ryan uh, Malone, easily accessible. And, and like I say, the commitment from, from our division, Bunzel Processor Division, to animal welfare and stunning, uh, to have two people on staff and to never charge for our services anywhere in the United States. That's huge. Granted, I mean, uh, it, there, I know I've made mistakes in the past. Maybe I missed a call, whatever. Didn't get a call back, whatever it might be. We do our best. Mm -hmm. uh, and with having a backup now with Jarvis for the last six years, well, they actually have field technicians in the field that are fully trained on all this equipment. Now you've got a team of about 22 people for, plus in, inside staff, customer service, uh, those types of things. Uh, we can pretty much address anything. Uh, anything we can do to assist you and help you at your plant basically oh. is what we can do for you. Awesome. All right. I'm going to...